We are on. Let's make everybody welcome. Thank you for listening today. Deuteronomy chapter 29. The book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book in the Bible in the Old Testament, chapter number 29. And I'm beginning my text in verse 21. And the Lord shall separate him unto evil out of all the tribes of Israel, according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the law. So that the generation to come of your children that shall rise up after you and the stranger that shall come from a far land shall say, when they see the plagues of that land and the sickness which the Lord hath laid upon it, and that the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning, that it is not sown, nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein. He compared it to the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, Adma and also Zimon, which, is, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. Now these two towns that are mentioned after Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Admath and Zeboam, these two towns were suburbs of Sodom and Gomorrah. And God is reminding them of how he destroyed that city because of their sin and because of their rebellion. When you study the book of Deuteronomy, it's the fifth book of the Old Testament. Moses wrote what we call the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible. The word Deuteronomy means the law to be given the second time. Moses is reminding them of the covenant that God made with them back in the book of Exodus. Because now here in the book of Deuteronomy, before this book ends, Moses will die. He's retelling about God's law to his chosen people, Israel, that was given to them when they came out of bondage. When Moses set them down and, and was giving them Deuteronomy chapter 29, they were in the land of Moab just about 40 days before crossing the Jordan River and entering the promised land. This is the last public address Moses will take before the nation before he dies himself. This speech is after leading them and their forefathers through a rebellious journey of 40 years in the wilderness. It's a fairly long commencement address that Moses gives. As a matter of fact, it lasts from chapter 29 all the way through chapter 33. It's during these chapters that Moses reminds them of God's covenants, his anger, his commandments, his jealousy, his vengeance, as well as his divine presence. When he concludes in chapter number 34, Moses goes up to Mount Nebo by himself, has a confrontation with God, and there Moses dies alone in the arms of God. Moses, in chapter 23 and on, he accused the adults of not leaving the next generation anything to work with in the land. You see in verse 23, he's charging these adults and he said, it's pitiful that the next generation coming on, when they inherit the land, it's going to look like Sodom and Gomorrah. Because of your plagues and your rebellion, you're going to forget about God and God's going to send three things, brimstone, salt, and burning. You find that in verse number 23. Why are these significant talking about the next generation? Brimstone is a type of sulfur, and once it catches on fire and it burns, it vaporizes and turns into a gas. We call it sulfate dioxide. Because it's heavier, the gas is heavier than air, it falls to the ground. So once it's vaporized, it falls and clings to the moisture that is found on grass and plants. When it's mixed with water, it forms an acid and burns all the plant life to death. God said, in your rebellion, I'm going to send plagues. And in those plagues like Sodom and Gomorrah, I'm going to send brimstone to burn up the crops of the land. The second thing he said was he would send salt. I did not know this, but salt kills plants and grass. And here's how it does it. It restricts the fluid intake being absorbed by the root. In other words, the salt stops the root from inhaling moisture so eventually everything dehydrates and dies. God also said he would send burning. 
When you burn a barren field, many of you old-time farmers know once you burn a field, it takes years for life to come out of that ground again. And God is saying through Moses to the adults, it's a shame that you're not living the next generation, leaving them something to work with. I want to preach on the subject for a few minutes where Moses said, the generation to come. I want to talk about the generation to come. Just a few minutes ago, you saw about 15 of our young people stand before you. We have many more than that, but some could not stay for practice and others just wouldn't. But you saw what we're raising and where we are headed. God has blessed us with young families, married couples, people with children. And I'm afraid that spiritually speaking, we're not leaving much for the next generation to work with so that they can be fruitful in their life when they become adults for the honor and the glory of God. Now, it's easy to beat on the kids. It's easy to talk about how sorry it is. It's easy to talk about the school system. It's easy to talk about how wicked the world is. But I tell you, some of the church adults need to absorb the responsibility that we have not done what we are supposed to do to equip our children and how to be effective for God when they become adults. So when you read through these chapters, 1 through 34, where Moses dies, you'll find that Moses begins to give some inklings on why the next generation doesn't stand a chance. Let me tell you something I've learned about the business world and the church world. You can complain about stuff all you want, but if you're not finding solutions with your complaint, all you're doing is jacking your jaw, running your mouth, and sounding like everybody else. I know there's a problem. You know there's a problem. So let's shut up talking about the problem and focus on some solutions we can give our children so that when we're dead and gone, they don't have a barren land, but they have an opportunity to be fruitful and grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, Moses begins to show the adults some places where they have failed that eliminates the next generation from having an opportunity to be fruitful in God. You'll find these in different chapters. We'll not turn to them. I will mention them. Number one, Moses said, I'll tell you why we're going to lose the next generation to come. Because we were fearful when we faced opposition. You remember now they've wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. The journey from coming out of Egypt to getting into Canaan land should have been 10 days. But instead, it took them 40 years. Let me tell you why it took them 40 years. Moses was dumb enough to start a deacon board. And he took 12 men, one out of every tribe. I felt a little kick back there, but I said it anyhow. He took 12 men, one from each tribe, and he sent them over in the Canaan land when Israel was still on the east side of Jordan. And when he sent them over there, just like most deacon boards, 10 of them came back with a bad negative report, and all they could do was criticize and complain. And they said to Moses, we look like grasshoppers in their sight. We look like nothing. If we try to go over the Jordan, they'll kill us before we ever get off the muddy banks of the Jordan. But listen, when you go for God, you cannot look at the conflict and the commander-in-chief at the same time. As long as you're looking at opposition, you will always be a pansy. You will always be a coward. You will always be a quitter. But you got to remember, the same one that brought them out of Egypt, the same one that parted the Red Sea, the same one that would have parted the Jordan, said everywhere you put your foot, I'll give it to you for an inheritance. But because the people didn't like the fight, they spent 40 years correcting a 10-day journey. Could it be that the reason why the next generation has nothing to work with is because we are a generation of no confrontation? Is it that we don't want to publicly take a stand and stand against those things that we know will negatively affect the next generation? Yes, we're so busy looking at the conflict that we forget there's a commander in charge of this. 
God help us men and women to get a backbone like a saw log and stand for what is right and stand against what is wrong so that the next generation can at least have a decent chance to live for God. Don't let the size of the enemy intimidate us or push us to remain silent. I don't care how big the adversary is. I don't care how loud he cusses and how strong he breathes. There is a God in heaven that can take them down and subdue them. And the Bible said, put our enemies under our feet. Quit being a pansy. Quit being so passive. Your kids are in a public school system. They are anti-God, to say the least. They're not a public school anymore. They're a government school. And every time a drag queen comes to read a book at your school, you ought to be raising hell down at that school and letting that principal know we're not putting up with that bunch of nonsense. You ought to be doing it. Don't clap, bless God, and leave it up to me. You ought to be down at the school saying this ain't going to happen. When a transgender comes in to teach on sex education, you ought to be in the principal's office saying that's not going to happen. They are not. We have got to start taking a stand. I remember when I was living in Mississippi, they came through with a big liquor crowd and had all kinds of advertisements. Spent thousands and thousands of dollars trying to get liquor in our town that had always been dry. We'd never sold liquor in our town. And I went by the mayor's office and he just passed away and he was a good man. And he always let me come to his office and have prayer with him. And when they were bringing in that liquor crowd, I'm talking big time money. Brother, when you start talking about Budweiser and Blue Label and all, you're talking deep pocket people. And they wanted to come in and raid our county with a liquor crowd. All of our restaurants, everything was dry. All my stores were dry and still are, by the way. And uh, so they came in with a liquor crowd and wanted to fight. And I went to the mayor's office. And I said, Mayor, I need you to publicly take a stand against this liquor crowd. He said, well, they know I don't drink and I don't promote drinking. What do you want me to do? I said, I want you to tell them to get their tail out of here. We don't want liquor in this place and go somewhere else. He said, now, preacher, I'm a politician. You understand. I said, I understand one thing. Somebody needs to be raising hell about this, and it's got to be done publicly. I said, if your grandkid gets killed because some drunk goes to sleep behind the wheel, you'd have wished you'd have been more vocal about this thing. He said, you tell me what you want, and we'll do it. I said, really? He said, you name it, I'll do it. I said, you got a deal, buddy. So I said, first of all, I want a tow truck from the city to go get one of the most mashed up cars out of the junkyard, and I want you to block the four-lane intersection on Main Street and drop that car in the middle of the road. He said, but I said, I said, you told me anything. Get that tow truck down there and get that car. And brother, they brought an old bashed up car and it was smashed down and he dropped it right in the four lane intersection of that town. He said, preacher, what are you going to do? I had four men put fake blood on them, rip their clothes off of them, get inside that car and hang out all four sides. I said, I need an ambulance. I need four gurneys. I want the lights going. I want the sirens going. And I want him to block that interstate. And I want all those gurneys lined up on the side of the road. He said, but do you know how much that? I said, you told me anything. Get the freaking ambulance on Main Street like you told me you would do. Brother, he called the ambulance company from the fire department and said, this is crazy, but I need four gurneys. I need the lights on. I need the sirens going. I need the doors open. I called him again. I said, I need the fire department there. He said, nothing's on fire. I said, you wait and see if something don't get on fire. So he called the fire department. We had fire trucks blocking all four intersections. Nobody knew what was going on. So it went out through the town. There's been a nasty wreck on Main Street. Dead bloody bodies are hanging out of the windows. Ambulance got gurneys lining up and down the sidewalk. The fire department's there. I smelled gas. It smells like it's going to catch on fire any minute. It wasn't long, brother, to thousands. I said thousands 
of people flung that intersection. All the bootleggers came and was sitting on the back of their cars, sitting there watching, laughing at the scene. When I got up to preach, thousands of people had gathered in the middle of that intersection. And I said to them, I said, you see them bootlegging Whore hopping money hungry devils sitting on the truck of their cars. They don't care about you and your family. When you die drunk, they won't even send a funeral to your to your gravesite. They don't care nothing about you. What I told them. I said, you think that bootlegger cares if your kid has shoes? You think they care if your daughter has proper food? You think they care if you've got a roof over your head? Look at them laughing, sitting on the hood of their car. They're laughing because you're stupid enough to pay for your own damnation. And brother, listen to me, look up here. For 30 years, that town stayed dry. For 30 years. I said, for 30 years. You know why it stayed dry? Because one man, one man said, I'm not going to put up with this. You don't need a crowd. You don't need to check the polls to see how many's on your side. It doesn't matter. If somebody comes up against the things of God for the sake of our children and grandchildren, we have got to stand up and not shut up. I ain't afraid of anybody. I'm not afraid of anybody, and you shouldn't be afraid of anybody. Some cross-eyed retard drove around this church and shot all the windows out with a nine millimeter. You gutless piece of trash. You didn't have the guts to come down here and do it while I was here. Because I tell you, I ain't afraid of you. I ain't afraid of you or your mama. What in the name of God has happened to us? The average Christian is so gutless. Bless God, if you hit a windshield, you ain't got enough guts to make a splat. But God give us some men and women that'll stand up and look in the face of your sons and daughters and say, we're not going that route. They're not doing that to you. I got to make sure the land is ready for you to be fruitful for God. Yeah, am I preaching now? Got to quit being afraid of opposition. Let it come. Oh, I got all kinds of letters and emails. Shut the church down. Corona's going to kill everybody in your church. I said, my church ain't none of your business. You don't go here. You're not a member here. You don't tithe here. It ain't none of your business what we do at a mass. And all of a sudden, the politicians got in on it. Oh, we got to stop Brother Kidd. All the churches in Kingsport have shut down, but Brother Kid, it looks bad that Brother Kid's still having church. We got to do something about Brother Kid having church. All the Pentecostals that preach on healing all the time, they were the first ones that shut their doors. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. I ain't never figured that out yet. I got a real problem with that. Where's all your healing oil now, brother? All of them shut down. Even Baptist preachers called me and criticized me. Why are you being indifferent? Why are you got to stand out? They put us on the news. They put us in the newspaper. They shot the windows out of the building. They threatened to kill me, rape my wife, molest my grandkids. I got a call from the governor's office saying, you got to shut her down. I called the governor's office and I said, you tell the governor I said this. If he wants to shut a man's down, get his butt down here and try shutting it down. We'll find out if he'll shut her down. We'll find out who shuts her down. Two days later, one of his men called and said, we've re reconsidered what we said, and y'all just be careful up there in Kingsport. We never have shut down. You know why it may have stayed open? One man said, you're not controlling us. You're not telling us when to have church. You're not telling us when we... <laughs> You got to stand for what's right. Number two, not only fearful in opposition, but chapter six, they'd forgotten their history. History should not be partial to any country. History should record its good as well as its bad. Moses was afraid that the people wouldn't remember God's miracles and God's goodness on their behalf. May I say, I think many countries, including ours, are guilty of such. America has experienced both good and bad times. And I think we ought to teach honest history in our school within its context for two reasons. 
Number one, to keep us from making the same mistakes we made before. And number two, to constantly remind the next generation that this is the most phenomenal, miracle country this world has ever known. And it's not because of Buddha, and it's not because of Muhammad, and it's not because of politics. It's because of God Almighty. We should teach them that we are one nation under God. I like the fact that we have in God we trust on our money. You atheists don't like it? Give me your money. You won't ever have to look at it again. But America has not been flawless. We have made bad mistakes. Mistakes we needed to repent of not only privately but publicly. Slavery was in our initial constitution. Slavery should have never been. It's never right for any human race to subject another human race to any kind of slavery based on the color of their skin or the country that they came from. Slavery should have been abolished many, many, many years ago. What about the women's right to vote? Did you know there was a time constitutionally a woman could not vote? That was not right then, and it's not right now. But I don't believe any race in that. We ought to teach our kids this is how America was. But we have learned, and we have gotten better. And we are not afraid to change. We are not afraid to make things more wholesome, more accepting, more equal. I said more equal. Nobody should be judged by the color of their skin. Nobody should be judged by their sexuality. You are not better because you're a man. You are not better because you are white. And Moses is reminding them as Israelites, we have made mistakes. Israel made racial mistakes. If they were not Jews, Israel rejected all other nations for they felt like they were superior to them. Nations make mistakes. The only kingdom that will ever be flawless is when Jesus sits on the throne of David and rules and reigns out of Jerusalem. That's when the government will be perfect. But we cannot forget our history. We cannot allow yellow belly, communistic, socialistic, milk toast, watered down historians to rewrite our history books and teach our kids recollections that never happened in this country. We cannot allow that to happen. You forget your history, and it doesn't give our next generation a chance. Number three, when you forsake God's word, the next generation doesn't stand a chance. You remember in chapter 9, Moses is, he's kind of, Brother Mark, reminiscent. He said, hey, let me tell you something. You remember when I was up on the mountain 30 days with God, and I was filled with the Holy Ghost, talking with the Lord? And while I was up there, God carved out two tablets of stone. And with his own finger, he wrote 10 commandments on those two tablets. And the Bible said when Moses came down the bottom of the hill, Joshua met him there. And uh, Moses said to Joshua, what's that noise? Now the Bible says they were playing music. But Moses called it noise. And it would do you young people well to learn there's a difference in real music and just a bunch of noise. Now, I'm going to preach whether you clap or not. So Moses came down and Joshua said, don't you know I ain't got nothing to do with what's going on? Moses said, what's going on? He said, your associate pastor has cut your throat. And it was his brother. He said, what do you mean he cut my throat? He said, well, you were up there with God. He got all the gold earrings and that off the women and made a golden calf like the one that was in Egypt and said, that thing is out on the side of the mountain. And now and he said, Moses, I'm going to tell you, it's going to get worse. They're not only playing bad music. Everybody's naked. Moses said, they what? He said, man, they dancing around one of the golden calves of Egypt. They're playing bad music. Ain't nobody got any clothes on. From Papa to the great grandkids, everybody's naked. And they're dancing around this golden calf. And you know what the Bible said Moses did? The Bible said that Moses' anger waxed hot. I looked that word waxed hot. It means hot as hell. I'm going to preach a message on spirit-filled and mad as hell. 
Moses looked at that crowd and said, this book means nothing to them. God's word means nothing to them. The fact that I've been with God means nothing to them. They're naked. They're dancing around a calf. They're playing ungodly music. They're going back in the paganism that God delivered. And the Bible said that Moses took those Ten Commandments and threw them on the ground in his anger and broke the word of God. You know why the next generation doesn't have much to work with? Because we, had, we are a generation that can't take preaching anymore. And sometimes, brother, preachers and leaders, they're so discouraged because of the lack of response when they give out God's word that they want to throw it down and quit and go back into the public workforce and forget the ministry altogether. Here they had a godly leader. They had the blessings of God on them. They had the written word of God. And they still wanted worldly entertainment and fleshly lust. I want to encourage you pastors and leaders that are listening to me today. Don't you dare throw down that book. Don't you ever let them make you so discouraged that you want to quit because of their lack of obedience to God. We need some Moseses that'll get back up on the hill with God and stay until they have a word and bring it down and preach the people as they are. Moses watched the people of God drift and their desires of the people that said they were saved living ungodly like the perverted lost humanity they were surrounded by i believe with all of my heart if jesus does not come in the near future what i'm doing today will be considered a hate crime and i will be put in jail for preaching what i am preaching today because the bible said in the last days that people will turn their ears from the truth they don't want to hear bible preaching anymore there's a few things, a man come to me some time ago and said, there's a few things you could leave alone and this church would fill up. You know what my answer was? Fill up with what? Bunch of cigarette sucking, diesel sniffing, southern gospel run around. <laughs> I can't take a thimble full of preaching. No, thank you, honey. I'll keep what I got. We're not letting go of preaching because you don't like it. You can stay here as long as you want, honey, but I'm not changing because of you. And you can wave your wallet and have your family stand up and talk about how essential you are to this church. But Emmaus was here before you got here. Emmaus will be here after you're gone. We don't need God. God don't need us, but we sure do need God. And God honors Bible preaching. Your kids have to have Bible preaching. For God's sakes, don't leave a church because they skate more, or they have pizza more, or they have more outings, or they have more activities. Don't leave a church because of that. You get you a fire-breathing man of God that's not for sale and believes that Bible is inspired and will stand in that pulpit without fear and without favor and preach. You know, Brother Randy, I may be wrong, but I was reading in 2 Timothy again yesterday, and here's what the Bible said. And they shall turn their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables, stories. And here's what the Bible said. They shall heap to themselves, heap means bunches of them, teachers, now watch this terminology, having itching ears. Now give me, let me give you something about Brother Derek. I've always thought the itching ears were the people that were heaped up with these teachers. It's the people that want tickled. But if you'll really look at that and grammatically break it down in English, it could be referring to the preachers. See, preachers like to be patted on the back. They like to feel good too. So the way they get everybody to love them and nobody to be offended at them is they just quit preaching against anything. Then they stand at the back door and they love when you pat them on the back, slip that $100 bill in their pocket, tell them how wonderful they are. Somebody said to me at a restaurant, I was giving out my cars. They said, oh, you ought to come to our church. Everybody loves our pastor. I said, lady, that's all I need to know about your pastor. I have no desire. The Bible, Jesus said, you better watch a man everybody speaks well of. I've never had that problem ever since I've been to Kingsport. I've had a bunch of lizard, lizard tongue Jezebels, bunch of pop belly troublemakers that's tried to run me out of Kingsport. But they are gone, and I am still here, and I'm preaching like I did when they were here, and I'm preaching like they did now that they're gone. I'm not changing. 
They forsook the word of God. I've got to close. I'm out of trouble. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in trouble and I got to go. Chapter number 12, they got the fooling around with false prophets. It's in that chapter God told Moses, when you take over a pagan land, I want you to destroy their temples of the false gods, get rid of all their pagan worship. I want you to burn their altars. I don't want nothing left. Because God knows when you allow both to coexist, they will eventually begin to mingle together and the paganism will begin to drift in and affect real worship. The Bible says there is only one way to worship God and it has two elements to it. That is in spirit and in truth. Now let me tell you something about the spirit and truth. They coexist, they coexide, and they're parallel. In other words, they run together. In other words, they never contradict each other. They never cross each other. Let me tell you something about the Holy Ghost. He will never tell you to do something that's forbidden in that book. Because they're parallel. They're one of the same, by the way. So they run together like train tracks. So when somebody comes up to me and says, you know, the Spirit told me to do this. And I say, yeah, well, the Bible says this. Say, you know what they say? I don't care what it says. I know what God told me. Well, let me tell you something, Jack. I don't trust you as far as I can throw you with a brick truck on top of your head. I don't care what you say the Holy Ghost told you. If it's not found in that book, you better run from it. Why do you think God left you a Bible anyhow? The Bible said that we could try the spirits to see if they're of God. Now, I'm going to preach a little bit right now. There's a lot of stuff coming on in our churches that's being blamed on the Holy Ghost, and he ain't nowhere around that mess. And I'm telling you, as your pastor, I don't care what comes on the scene, how popular it is. If it contradicts this book, I'm not doing it. We're not getting involved, and it's not coming in this church. Can you take two more, even though I'm out of time? Can you take two more? I need to get all this off me anyhow. My wife's out of town. I'm in a bad mood. Reason why kids don't have anything to work with coming on is because of the fleshly lawlessness of our generation. Chapter 2, Moses starts dealing with immorality. And man, is this a topic, my Lord, that needs to be dealt with. I ought to preach a whole message on it. Did you know in the Bible... Now think about this now. Don't get mad at me. I'm just quoting the scripture, all right? Did you know in the Bible, if a girl got married, her husband had to buy her from her dad? Uh, Samson got a good deal. He, he bought a woman for a goat. That's a pretty good deal until you saw her. <laughs> so a young man had to buy his wife like Jacob did, both of his wife with Laban, his father-in-law. So that was an Old Testament custom. But if a man bought his wife, and on their honeymoon, she was not a virgin, he had the biblical right to take her back to her dad and get all of his stuff back because he wasn't tied to her because she lied about her purity. I told you to get quiet, didn't I? If a man and a woman fornicated in Deuteronomy 22 before they were married, both of them were taken to the elders and they were stoned out in the street so that the young people knew there was a moral boundary that you keep yourself until you're married. Now, I know this is not popular, and I know you parents won't support it because you did it, but it's still the Bible, and I can't change it. I'm not going to change it. 1 Corinthians 7 says it's better for a man not to touch a woman. It didn't say it was sinful. It said it was better for you not to touch him. But to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So God instituted marriage to subdue a desire that God puts in a man to be with a woman and in a woman to be with a man. And if you don't have that desire and you're in your teenage years, please talk to your parents. You need to see a doctor. Something is not right. It is, it is a normal thing for you to start looking at girls in a different manner when you get into a certain age bracket. And it's, and it's the same thing for the girls to start looking at boys in a different manner. But that does not mean that we're, we are a lawless people and that you fornicate with everything that has a pair of pants on. Now, I'm going to preach this, and I know people don't like it. Every time I preach this, I get cuss mail, but it's not going to stop me. All I'm trying to do is keep your daughter from being a backseat whore, and I'm keeping your boy from running around like a dog in heat. Now, if that bothers you, then you need to talk to God about it. 
Now, you better thank God we're not under Old Testament biblical morals because most churches would be empty today. So we have become silent with our responsibility on this gory thing called sex. Parents have miserably failed in addressing the sexuality from a godly viewpoint that God illustrates in the Bible. Instead, we've allowed perverts, transgender, and drag queens to set the standards of morality in the public school. And by the way, the reason why a lot of parents won't, preach, won't, won't back me when I preach this is I'm trying to keep your kids clean, but you're a bunch of whoremongers too. You're wrapped up on porn. You're, bang, you're banging some woman at the job. You're messing with some other guy. So you can't shout when I preach on this. Oh yeah, you want your daughter to be right, but you're a whore. You're an internet whore. You got more chat rooms than Joe Biden. You're not fooling me. You men, 65% of the men in church are hooked on porn. Hey, don't tell me how many people have looked at porn before they come to church today. Now you're going to stand on your feet and clap me on. All you do is sit around looking at porn. By, by the way, can I tell you sicko something? Why do you watch a woman that you will never meet when you got a woman laying right next to you in bed that you can have anytime you want? I ain't figured that out yet. Oh, I know I get people get mad at me. I don't want to go to church where they, where they talk about sex. Well, then fine, find you another church. But I'm telling you, I don't want a bunch of girls coming down this aisle pregnant, and I don't want a bunch of boys to be known as whoremongers in this community and being members of this church. I'm not going to put up with it, and I don't care if it is your kids. I'm going to deal with it until they stop it, or we're going to church them. Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed is undefiled, but whores and whoremongers, God will judge. You better remember when you take those vows and you say, I do, it's more than just a flippant thing of joining hands and having sex. You've made a commitment. This thing about marriage has been taken so lightly, it's pathetic. You've made a commitment before man and God that you would live with each other for better or worse, richer or poor, sickness and health, until death do you part. And some of you need to go back and redo your wedding vows again. You just can't jump out of a marriage because you're ticked off about something. I've been married 43 years. I've always been ticked off about something. But when love runs out, commitment keeps you together. Oh, yeah. I'm going to keep on preaching. I am. I was joking one time. My wife said to me, she said, honey, if I died, would you marry again? I sat there for a minute and I said, well... I wouldn't want to go to your funeral by myself. <laughs> and I don't have to tell you, I've never said that again. <laughs> that joke did not float. <laughs> but you ladies trying to keep your kids, you know, I was in Virginia some time ago, and a guy was raising some kind of hunting dog, I don't know, some old howling dog, had ears that long. And that old thing would hoot, he'd say that dog's worth $800. I said, my rifle's worth 1200 I'd like to put a bullet right between that thing's eyeballs. That thing never did shut up. I went to his house one night, and I looked, and his rifle's laying against every door. I said, brother, what? Are you in the militia? What are you doing? He said, oh, that old dog's in heat out there, and I don't want some trashy dog jumping the fence and getting her pregnant. I want to keep her clean. I said, I understand that. About that time, his daughter pulled up in the yard with her boyfriend, that looked like something he'd sprayed, dipped, and wormed. Seat of his britches dragging the back of his knees. Ain't never had a bath. Front of his face looked like it fell in a tackle box. His hair was so greasy you could change your oil in it. And I'm thinking, you're more interested in the purebred of a hound than you are the maid of your daughter. I hadn't preached 38 minutes, and I don't know when, but thank you for putting up with me. The last, uh, the last one. I know when the clap starts fading, it's time to stop, so I understand. The last one is, is chapter... <laughs> chapter 26 talks about forsaking the assembling of yourself in the house of God. Moses said, you want to go to church? Here's why you need to go. You attend it, you give to it, and you worship while you're there. Internet has caused a lot of people to get out of church. Thank God we have it for the elderly and the sickly and those that can't come to church. But it's amazing to me how people just quit coming to church and claim to be saved and know God. 
there's something bad wrong. I don't believe, I don't believe going to church takes you to heaven. But if what you have don't take you to a church, I doubt if it will take you to heaven. And it doesn't matter who you are. <clears throat> so I want to ask you this in closing. What kind of opportunity are we leaving the generation to come?